Good morning. There we go. For those of you who don't know me or those online, my name is Alex, and it is a joy to be with you. I am the lead pastor, and pardon my voice, I coach soccer as well. So uh, yesterday I was screaming and yelling from the sidelines, and um, I may not have a voice today. Um, <laughs> At Crossroads, we are moving to connect ourselves and others to God, and we want to make an impact in your life, in the community, and in the world for God. And it is our desire that you know you have value, worth, and purpose. And our hope is together we discover who God is and the love he has for each one of us. And we do this by connecting to God, connecting to others, and connecting others to God. And I say this every week because I want you to imprint it on your heart. Um, as I share the message today, feel free to cheer, to clap. We already got the clapping down earlier, thanks to Ryan, uh, to pray, to a say amen, to just move as the Spirit moves in you. If you have your Bibles, uh, we will be in John 13, or we will also have the screen um, as well. Uh, and in the bulletins, you can follow along with us. We are in this series called Going Places, and we're talking about the ultimate friend today, and that Jesus is the ultimate example of friendship, offering unconditional love and sacrifice. Now, friendship is something we all value, right? And, uh, but have you ever thought about what like, the best, the perfect friend would be? What would it be to have the ultimate friend, someone who's not just fun to be around, but genuinely loves you unconditionally, no matter what? Someone who's always there, who listens to you, encourages you, protects you, and never lets you down. Sure, we might have a best friend that we laugh with and we love to hang out with, but what would it look like to have the perfect friend, the ultimate friend? And you're thinking, is that even possible? Um, the kind of friend who never fails to show up, who's never late, who's always compassionate, who always loves you without limits, no matter what you do. What would that friend look like? The good news is this isn't a dream, but the reality is we have it in Jesus. In the scriptures, there's this moment where Jesus shows us exactly what it's like to be the ultimate friend. In John 13, Jesus, who is a teacher, a rabbi, someone we revere to his disciples, to his followers, takes on the task that's both surprising and humbling. He takes off his outer robe, and he wraps a towel around his waist, and he kneels down and begins to wash the disciples' feet. Now, you think about it for a moment. Well, a teacher, a rabbi, a leader... That's not someone who typically washes feet. In fact, washing feet at that time was left to only the servants, and not just any servant, the lowest of the low servant. And yet Jesus, God in flesh, does this very act. He surrenders his power and prestige so that we might have life. And today, we're going to look at John 13, where we'll discover how Jesus is not is just is the perfect friend, the ultimate friend who laid down his life for us. We'll explore the examples that he set and how we can be more like Jesus in everything that we do. Focus on Jesus' unconditional love, the ultimate sacrifice, and following his example. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, glorious and gracious God, you are so good. You are amazing. Even when we're lost, even when we're dirty, even when we're messy, even when our life is broken and falling apart, you are there. You are loving us and caring for us. And, oh, Lord, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for how you're a friend to us, no matter what we're going through, whether we're having the best time of our life or we're going through trouble and pain and suffering. So, Father God, let us lean into your word today and receive what you have for us. In your son's precious name, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to John 13, 1 through 5. You can also see it on the screen. And we're going to read about how Jesus washes his friend's feet. And Priscilla shared uh, the whole scripture. We're going to look at different parts of this. And so, John 13, 1 through 5. 
It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon, to betray Jesus. There we go. Jesus knew that the Father had put all the things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. I'll be honest, when I was reading the scripture, the first thing that came to mind was, Ick, ew, gross, feet, you're washing feet. Uh, because our feet get really dirty and gross. And if you don't shower them regularly, right, the gunk builds up. And I'm thinking, Jesus is washing feet? Gross! I don't want to wash feet. I mean, I know if I don't take a shower regularly, things build up in your feet like fungus. And they're just kind of gross. Our feet actually need a lot of TLC. I remember this one time I went to get a pedicure. This one time. That's all I ever needed. Um, <laughs> I felt so bad for the person because they had to scrape all the roughness and grime off my feet. They had to scrape all the messiness off my feet. And I was like, I'm really sorry for you <laughs> right now. But I guess that's just part of being human, right? We all need cleaning sometimes, right? Sometimes our souls inside and sometimes the outsides of our body. Now imagine how dirty the disciples' feet must have been. Jesus' friends uh, must have been because they walked around in dirt and sand with sandals where their feet are exposed. It's dusty. It's dirty. It's grimy. They are sweating. They are full of filth and maybe even walking through animal waste along the roads. It's gross. Actually, it's grosser than gross, but Jesus didn't flinch. He knelt down, and he cleaned his disciples' feet. It was more than just a gesture, like a nice thing to do. It demonstrated the depth of God's love for us. It was unconditional love, love that isn't deterred by dirt, messiness, or imperfections. In the same way, Jesus loves us no matter how messy our lives get. He meets us in our brokenness and he cleanses us and offers us love without hesitation. That's an amazing friend we have in Jesus. Now, something to note about this, this was the Passover meal or festival. And it commemorates when God rescued his people from slavery over a thousand years earlier. When God showed an immense amount of love to his people who were in the midst of brokenness, pain, and suffering. When their life was full of messiness, God entered to their life and showed them love. And here, once again, God is lavishing his love upon his people and his grace upon his people. In John 13, 1, it says he loved them to the end. He loved them to the very end. He loved them to the end. He continued to show his love until the moment he was taken and put on the cross. And John highlights this when he describes the washing of the feet and, the esta and establishing the Lord's Supper. And yet, and yet, even death couldn't stop God's love for us. Even death couldn't stop Jesus' love for you and I. Jesus ro rose from the grave and his love is still felt w by us every day. Jesus remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. His character never changes, and neither does his love. Even when you and I find ourselves lost in darkness, in brokenness, in messiness, even when our lives look a little bit dirty, Jesus still loves us, and he cleanses us. This brokenness, this messiness isn't his fault, but ours. And Jesus is the kind of friend who never leaves us behind. He's closer than a brother, and he loves us like no other. Jesus' unconditional love is shown in how he serves and cares for us without limits, even when we don't fully understand or feel deserving of it. That's in your notes. You can write down. 
fully understand or feel deserving of it. There are so many times that I don't feel worthy of God's love. There are so many times when I've messed up, when my life is messy and dirty, and I'm like, who could love me? And yet, what we see in the scriptures is that God's love never stops. That no matter how messy or dirty your life is, God sees you and loves you, even when we don't feel deserving of it. This is a love that brings you to your knees. This is a love that makes you raise your hands up and say amen. This is a love that will bring tears down your cheek because it is a love that you can't experience anywhere else. One of the things that amazes me about Jesus, and there are a lot of things that amaze me about Jesus, is he's always thinking ahead. He, like how he knows what he's doing now, is preparing his followers for what is to come. He's preparing you the deci- and, and I to what is coming next. The washing of the feet was only a glimpse of what Jesus was about to do. In this act of service, he was pointing ahead to the cross, where he would make the ultimate sacrifice for his friends. Washing his feet was a humble act, but dying on the cross was the ultimate expression of love. Jesus laid down his life for us, bearing our sins and shame so that we may be made clean and whole. In John 15, 13, it says, Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And that's exactly what he did. His sacrifice on the cross is the greatest act of friendship that's ever been known. And it's the foundation of our relationship with him. If we go back to verse 3, we see how Jesus was fully aware of his supreme power, his divine origin, and the glory he was about to return to. And yet, and yet, Jesus still chose to give his disciples a profound example of self-denial. And yet he still decided to wash their feet. John 13.3, John 13.3. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. And that he had come from God and was returning to God. So even though Jesus existed in the very form of God, he did not cling to the equality with God. Instead, he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant to become like us, embodying true humility and love. Can you imagine that? To empty yourself as a servant? And becoming like us, embodying true humility and love? Wow. That's an incredible God that we have. This act of washing his friend's feet was just a warm-up to the real sacrifice that would be made on the cross. Where he wouldn't just cleanse our bodies, but he would cleanse our souls. Jesus continues in verse 8 through 11 to use the foot washing to prepare the followers for the real sacrifice that was about to be made, the sacrifice on the cross. Here's verses 8 through 11. I want you to read this with me. Uh, 8 through 11. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet, Jesus answered. Unless I wash, you have no part with me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. Hmm. Did you catch... In that scripture we just read together that Peter was taken back. He was shocked. And wouldn't you be too? I mean, wouldn't it be kind of surprising if someone came up to you and said, I want to wash your feet? I'd be a little taken back. I'd be like, do you know how dirty these feet are? Do you know the last time I washed these feet? And Peter hesitates. I would too. I'd be like, "Mm, I don't think you want to wash my feet. Now imagine the person who's offering to wash your feet is a leader, a pastor, someone you revere and follow, someone that you respect and honor. 
Wouldn't you be really confused? Wouldn't you be thinking, I should be washing their feet? Why are they washing my feet? Wouldn't you pause or maybe even resist? Come on, have you seen my feet? How do I, do I deserve this honor? What prompted this action? What is the rationale behind this? At first, Peter is confused, and he thinks, wait, Jesus, my Lord and Messiah, is washing my feet? This doesn't seem right. Even after Jesus insists, Peter is still puzzled and ends up asking Jesus to wash not just his feet, but his whole body. Peter doesn't fully grasp what's going on here. And I, and I think if I was in the situation, I probably wouldn't grasp it either. But Jesus reassures him, you're already clean. He's reminding Peter that he is already clean because of his faith. And that Jesus will soon be doing atoning work on the cross. Where he will cleanse all those who believe. Peter doesn't understand what is transpiring. He thinks he's just maybe talking about physical dirt. But Jesus is talking more, talking not just about physical dirt. He's actually pointing to the cleanliness of the heart and soul that comes from following and obeying him. That what Jesus is doing here is only the beginning of what is to come. That the washing of feet, a small sacrifice, symbolized the forgiveness of the ongoing sinful behavior. But what is coming, Jesus going to the cross, will be the ultimate sacrifice. And he will scrape away all the roughness, all the grime. He will wash away all our sins. He will redeem and reconcile all of our messiness and our dirtiness and our brokenness and give us new life. Our slate will be clean. Amen? Amen. Amen. This is why I'm so excited that we get to baptize four people today. Westcott, a biblical commentator, says this. He is bath needs, so to speak, only to remove the stains contracted in the walk of life, just as the guest. After the bath needs, only to have the dust washed from his feet when he reaches the house of hosts. See, the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus reveals the depth of his love as he gave his life to cleanse and save us. And you notice this, as he gave his life to cleanse and save us. Jesus did what no one else could do or will ever be able to do. He didn't just wash our feet. He didn't just wash our outside. But it was the inside that he was cleansing. The dirtiness, the messiness that we hide from this world, that we hide from our neighbors, our friends, and our family, that's what he was cleansing. He was going to your soul. Now, there's something very practical also about what Jesus says here. And he sets the standard of how we should treat each other and how we should treat our friends. In verses 12 through 14, it says this. 12 through 14, it says this. Here's where he gets really practical. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on their clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightfully so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. He was calling us to follow his example, selfless love, humility, and service. It's not just about grand gestures. It's about true, authentic love. It's about daily acts of love towards one another, serving others, putting others' needs above our own, and showing grace and compassion even when it's difficult. And if anyone understood how difficult it would be to love others, it was Jesus, because the very people he was trying to love and reach would betray him, beat him, and put him on the cross to die. He would die for our sins and our messiness, and he, his love would wash away the dirtiest parts of our life. Now, Obviously, we can't die for the sins of others like Jesus did. But we can reflect his love in the way we live out our life. We can be the kind of friend who shows compassion, who listens, who sacrifices, who is a humble servant, and who offers grace and kindness. 
we can look to Jesus and say, how do I become a great friend? Maybe I can't be the ultimate friend, but how do I become a really great friend? We see throughout the New Testament, as it repeatedly emphasizes the power of leading by example, especially when Jesus points to himself. John 13, 12 through 14, the focus isn't on some profound spiritual concept or doctrinal teaching. It's about how we treat one another. It's very practical and tangible. And personally, I love this, these type of verses where I can get my hands around it. It's about not allowing the messiness of our lives to demean, divide, or destroy our relationships. It's about loving people in a way that looks beyond their dirt and serving them with humility, compassion, and grace, that G- and that same compassion and grace and love that Jesus showed his disciples. Francis Schaeffer wisely noted, love is the defining trait of a Christian. Since Jesus showed deep love for his disciples, since Jesus showed deep love for you and I, since Jesus showed us deep love, we should extend that same love to others. We are called to love others in the way that Jesus has loved us. Perhaps we can't be the ultimate friend, but we can be a really great friend by following the life and teachings of Jesus and the way we interact with other people. Following Jesus' example means being humbly serving others with love and compassion, just as he served us. Humbly serving others with love and compassion, just as he served us. Amen. I know this is really hard for us at times because people will make us upset. We'll get frustrated. People will break their promises. People will do things that hurt us. And yet, Jesus says, hey, I want you to show compassion and love and look beyond the dirt and messiness. In the end, Jesus is the ultimate friend. He loves us unconditionally. He sacrificed everything for us. And he invites us to love others in the same. This example is both humbling and inspiring. Imagine what our friendships, our relationships would look like if we modeled them after Jesus. Imagine the impact we would have on our communities and our families. Imagine how the world would change if we were selfless in our love. So as you think about your friends in your life, maybe you ask yourself, how can I follow Jesus' example? How can I love more unconditionally? How can I sacrifice for the good of others? What is the modern day metaphor for washing someone else's feet today? Jesus has shown us the way and he's calling us to follow him. This isn't easy, but this is exactly what God has called us to do. This is our mission field, to go into the world and to make disciples, to go into the world and to wash their feet, to go into the world to love people in the midst of their dirtiness and messiness and brokenness and suffering and pain. Jesus' unconditional love is shown in how he serves and cares for us without limits, even when we don't fully understand or feel deserving of it. I will tell you, most days I don't feel deserving of God's love. And yet he shows it to me every day. I wake up in the morning and I go to bed and his love is still there for me. The ultimate sacrifice of Jesus reveals the depth of his love as he gave his life to cleanse and save us. As he gave his life to cleanse and save us. He wasn't obligated to. He did go because he loved you. You need to hear that because that is so important. And last is following Jesus' example means humbly serving others with love and compassion, just as he served us. It means serving others with love and compassion, just as he served us. Today, we get to uh, honor four people as they get to be baptized and follow Jesus. And this is the most exciting thing for me. Um, I love watching people proclaim the goodness and grace of God. 
And if you've never accepted Jesus into your life, the first step is to say yes to Jesus. And the way we do that is we do what's called um, a prayer of salvation. If you've already said yes to Jesus, say this again and remind, use this as a confessional. Remind yourself about the goodness and grace of God. Every day we should wake up and be like, thank you, God. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for loving me. God, I am a sinner. I need to repent. Thank you, God. Amen. First step is saying yes to Jesus. And then the next step, if you've never been baptized, we would love to baptize you and welcome you into the kingdom. Let me pray for us, and I'm going to invite you into the prayer of salvation. Heavenly Father, glorious and gracious God, you are amazing and good, and God, I give you thanks. God, I give you thanks for the way you loved us, the way you walked with us, the way you are with us from the <laughs> when the sun comes out till the sun sets down. I love that you are with us from the beginning of time till the end of time. God, that you will never forsake us, that your love is always here for us. And God, all we have to do is turn and receive that love from you. You have never forsaken us. You've never left us. You've never denied us. God, if we turn to you, your love is there. No matter how broken or messy our lives are, your love and grace and mercy is there. Oh, Lord, I don't deserve this type of love. I didn't earn it. I didn't achieve it. But, God, you give this love freely. And so, Father, God, I give you thanks for the way you pour out your love upon everyone here and the way you pour your love upon me. And, God, may we receive that love today. In your son's precious name, amen. If you've never received Jesus or if you have uh, walked with Jesus your whole life, I encourage you to repeat this after me. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. Please forgive me. Come into my life. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Help me to live for you the rest of my life. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen.